Hi, I'm Warwick from Harder and Steenbeck, and this week, what I'm gonna try to give you, and this applies to any of you, whether you're painting canvases, automotive models, scale models, fantasy miniatures, whatever it might be, I'm gonna try to give you some really simple basic exercises that you can do with any airbrush that you have to up your game. And the topics that we're gonna cover are simple things that people sometimes struggle with, and I see people just missing a little bit of the correct technique that will just unlock so much more ease of painting to them. It's gonna be things like, how do you paint on a flat surface and get a perfectly even coverage? Secondly, how do you do a perfectly even blend over something where you're trying to blend one color into another? How do you access the very fine performance of your airbrush? And lastly, we're just gonna look at some simple exercises that you can do that will cause you to feel more and more and more comfort with your trigger and starting to feel much more like it's a second nature movement to you so that your relationship starts to be more with what's coming out and representing on what you're trying to paint and less with the airbrush itself. So let's dive right into it by looking at the simplest of techniques that I think affects a lot of you of how do we create a fine coverage over a part. Flat panels are actually the hardest, but a perfectly even coverage. Now, the key to this is how you pass over the panel. What I see a lot of people doing is just kind of wiggling the airbrush around over a panel. Now, if any of you have ever seen somebody spray painting a car, this is the highest level of skill when it comes to covering a panel with a perfectly even coverage. Anything you can do to emulate that technique is gonna up your game. And essentially what the car guys do when they're painting a panel is they start the spray gun moving before they turn the paint on, okay? and I'll show you why in a minute. Then they have this line that they go across the panel, perfectly even speed, even coverage, and then they switch the paint off before they stop moving. Okay, and the air is just on all the time. The second stroke, and this is the key, is you aim the center of your second stroke at the edge of the previous pattern. So let me show. So if we lay down a line, so I'm about a fist distance away, so I've got a nice bit of spread there. If we lay a line down here, now you'll see, because I started moving before I pulled back on the trigger, I've got a really nice feathered edge to the start, and because I didn't stop moving before I shut the paint off, I've got a nice feathered edge at the end. Okay, that's a really key thing. Now, the second stroke, this is where the edge of the spray pattern is, okay? I'm not gonna be aiming here to try to join these two patterns together. I'm gonna aim here with the center of my second pass, and that is what will give me this perfectly even coverage. And again, aiming at the edge of the previous. And there you can see you've got a coverage there. It's not wet, so it's not like we're trying to paint a car panel, but there's no kind of bands in between where we're missing a bit of color. We can develop that really nicely to get a really nice even coverage of that spray. Now, if I want to develop it further and turn it into a shading, then all I'm going to do is I'm going to start concentrating again and going over the same part once or twice more. So I'm going to cover the bottom two thirds again. Now I'm going to cover the bottom half again. The same technique aiming at the center of the previous stroke, and then I'm gonna do the bottom third. And now what we've got is a color grade, and it's really nice and gradual. If we wanna fade it out a bit more at the top, come a little bit further away, and just think about it as if we're dusting the color on, okay? And now we've got this really nice gradual color fade going up there. The key to it is, the key to it is, is that the first stroke goes down, the second stroke, I aim at the edge of the first, then I aim at the edge of the second, I aim at the edge of the third. And that is what gives you this even coverage. It's really important. If we're working in a vertical stroke, same thing. Lay the first one down, I aim at the edge of the first, the edge of the second, aim at the edge of the third, the edge of the fourth. As long as I'm always doing that, it's always gonna be an even coverage. Don't do this where you lay a stroke down and then you try to join them up because you end up with this band in the middle, okay, where the coverage is not the same. 
Okay, so the key is put the band down, second stroke, aim at the edge of the previous one. That's the key to getting a perfectly even coverage over a flat panel or a panel with a slight curve. Remember what I said earlier about only pulling the trigger back once you started to move. The reason why that's important is if you don't do that and you do this, it's what I call a dumbbell effect. You see how it's darker here and it's darker here. Now the reason is, is because you're slowing down, changing direction and moving back this way. And what that does, that pause, means that the airbrush is static over here, laying paint down when you're not moving just for an instant, but you get that darker build. You compare it to the one above, where you can see these edges are perfectly feathered. So anytime you change direction, my recommendation is, if you're looking for even coverage, is listen carefully now. You'll hear the airbrush, the, the air will stay on, but the paint atomization will stop and start again as I change direction. If you watch my trigger finger, you'll see that moving as well. Okay. By the way, the paint dilution that we're using here, of course, is what we usually use for these demos. It's not to say it's the law, but it's just a convenient way of working. We're using some Vallejo air paints and they're diluted one-to-one -one with their thinner. Okay, so what we've looked at now is we've done working into a flat panel, trying to get the coverage even. That's very intimately related to color blending. I'm just gonna go over that again briefly. The basic secret to color blending in my view and the mistake that I see a lot of people making is that they tend to think that the most intense value they put down first and then they try to feather that out. Now I think that's way way harder and you've got much less control than if you put down the lightest value over the whole area where you want the fade to be and then using that same very slight trigger setting you then overlayer the bottom part of that again. So I'm doing a fade that's starting low here, intense to fading out. The lower part I'm gonna layer again, and then even lower I'm gonna layer again, and even lower I'll layer again. So the most intense part of my color fade is gonna be a multi-layer version of the least intense part of my color fade. And it's just more reliable because it gives you more points along the journey of creating that fade where you can go, oh, no, that's enough, I'm good with that. When you lay down like a heavy value first and try to feather it out, then you've got to try to lose a bit of an edge to it. You might find that you've gone a bit too heavy in the first instance. You've got less decision points along the way to say, mm, I'm happy with that, it's cool. So let's have a look at that again. So again, we're using this, this idea that we create the stroke, we, we're moving when we start the stroke, we're moving when we finish the stroke to get those feathered edges. And then all of the strokes, I'm gonna aim the center of the next one at the edge of the previous. So we're gonna lay down our first one. Let's do it on the corner here, actually. So we're gonna aim at the corner of the page here. I'm gonna lay that center of the pattern goes to the edge of the previous. So I'm just laying down. So that's my area, my whole area I wanna do the fade on. Now I'm gonna get onto the bottom of it and I'm gonna hit same trigger pullback, nothing different, just patient, patient, patient. I'm gonna hit that same value up to about two thirds of the way up. Now I'm gonna hit it again. I'm gonna go to about halfway up. I'm gonna hit it again. About a third of the way up and one last pass on the bottom. And now you see here, you've got this lovely grade of this color fading out as it goes up the page. We can kind of make it a bit more fun by shaping that corner a bit maybe. So now we're using a stroke that's got some shape to it. And there we see we've got a nice little, uh, let's fade this out too actually, so that we've got a bit more shape on the bottom edge here. And so now you can see we've got this very gradual color fade. And if we were putting color onto color, we could, for example, get over a yellow with this blue and create a green. Because what we're doing here is we're making something that's transparent values of the color that we're working with. So this is really, really important. When you're trying to make a fade, work with the lightest value and multi-layer it to get your highest value. So that's really what the core of that one is. The other technique that we're now gonna have a little bit of a look at is putting down point highlights and point details. And these are really, really easy. And the way that I like to think about these, 
And this is what I really like about a slow delivery with the airbrush. And this is where I think the smaller nozzle sizes like the 0.28 are super, super useful because you can lay these kind of details down and just watch them build and then go, I'm good with it, that's enough. As opposed to a larger nozzle size, which is a little bit faster on the delivery and it's a little bit more kind of like a fear kind of deal where you know you pulse the trigger a bit and you might have a bit too much. So this is where a smaller nozzle size is super valuable because you just got a longer time that it develops more decision points along the way to decide when you want to shut that trigger off. So let's look at putting down like a larger size of circle. So we're just fairly far away, about a fist distance away. And we're going to pull that trigger back until we see the color start to develop and decide when we want to close it off. Okay, so that's the same basic principle as to when you're trying to apply a very, very small point highlight, but everything is smaller. So the distance is smaller, the pullback is smaller, the weight and the development time is probably about the same. So we come in much closer, we press the trigger down, we get the air moving, and then we just start edging the trigger back, watching the color develop, and then decide when we want to stop. So that's a really nice little intense point highlight. It's beautifully feathered, exactly what we want. We did that over a build time of about two seconds. So you've got so many decision points in there where you can go, I'm good with that, we'll stop. And this is really the key to being able to airbrush in a way where you're very much in control of what you're creating because you're letting the color come up slowly, come up slowly. You've got so many decision points as to where your definition of perfection on that stroke is gonna come. So that's a really good piece of advice, I think, especially when we're putting on final highlights, bits of tint, small details on small areas, is try to get them delivering slowly so that you've got lots of time to decide when you think it's perfectly finished and perfectly delivered. And then the last stroke that I want you guys to practice. Now, you may or may not ever use this one. It's not a stroke that's commonly used in modeling. It's more often used uh, in canvas painting or automotive painting but it is so fundamental to achieving mastery over your trigger. And this is the dagger stroke. Now, it's super difficult to do, but it's really worth trying to master. Essentially what it is, is it's coming in from a big trigger opening far away, zooming down to the surface that you're painting whilst shutting the trigger and bringing that stroke to a point. And if you can master that, then you will really get some very, very high level of control over your trigger and anything else that you then seek to do after that, you're gonna find it much, much easier. So a dagger stroke looks something like that. So we're looking to have these, we're zooming in from further away, very wide. We've got this intensity building and coming down to a point. So these are big dagger strokes. And then of course you've got smaller ones. And the goal of that is really just to increase your mastery of the trigger. There's lots and lots of other things that you can do as well. You can practice flick strokes. I'm gonna put on my reading glasses for this one, where you have a bit of angle and you flick out. This is a great way of building up a, a nebula that's rushing across the sky, perhaps. Practice those too. It's all about this uh, coupling the movement of the airbrush with the movement of your trigger finger. Okay, so you're aiming at a point and you're flicking away, flick away, flick away, flick away. As you start to flick, you pulse the trigger. And these strokes, whilst they may or may not be useful in whatever kind of airbrushing you're looking to do, what they do do is they really help you to gain like a second nature feeling on the trigger so that your relationship begins to be with the paint and not with trying to figure out how to control your trigger and how to control your trigger finger to get the result you want. So do these drills. It's a great thing to start your painting session with. Just get a piece of A4 paper, get some food coloring. That's always good for that. Or you can mix up some paint one-to-one -one and just hit it with that. But it's a great way to just kind of get yourself into the into the, the feeling of how to feel your airbrush and really be in control of what that trigger's doing. Now, all of these things can also be done even with the 0.45 setup on the Ultra. So I've had this with paint sitting in it while we've been filming this, but here it is. So we're gonna do a color fade on this edge here and do it in the same way that we did with the other one. So we put the light value down, go over it again up to 
two thirds, then go over it again up to one third, all with the same trigger movement. And by the way, on the uh, collar setting on the Ultra, this is somewhere around about setting number one, uh, number two that I'm using for this. So we're looking for a very fine build. And then you go over the base of that a few more times. And there you've got this beautiful color fade coming in there. Now, if we want to go to setting number three, and we get very, very close, we're going to find that just by moving that figure of eight around and pulling it all the way back to stop, here we go. We can accomplish this line work with the Ultra. So I'm almost touching now. And look at the lines that this thing can create. And then, what I always say to people with the Ultra is enjoy the collar, use it to give you confidence, but please, at least once every painting session, do something with it on this setting where the trigger's free, okay? Where you can learn, you can try to feel that muscle memory that the collar has helped you to build and practice your dagger strokes. So you're learning how to use the airbrush on a full trigger. You're pushing yourself. You're doing your point highlights with the, the free trigger and you're learning how to really feel that, what the airbrush is capable of doing so that you become the master. And you can go out and in. So we're going smaller trigger movement, smaller distance, further out, bigger trigger distance, and then coming back in. Those exercises will make you a master of your tool. Spend a few minutes every time you pick the airbrush up, just having a go at these simple things and I can guarantee you that it's going to make airbrushing way more enjoyable for you and you will begin to be in charge of your tool and your creative potential will blossom. In the meantime, enjoy. Thanks ever so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed making this video. These are the things that really helped me when I began. And so I hope they do the same for you. Thanks for being with us.